The arts are a very important part of the community, and you're sitting in one of the most important pieces of that. I next have the privilege of introducing somebody who also lives just next door at the Alliance Theater, and is a dear friend, as well as being a nationally famous director and the head of the Alliance Theater. One of the things that the Alliance has done under Susan's leadership is create the Candida Playwriting Competition, which is a senior graduate playwright competition in which the reward is not a reading of the play, it's an actual production. And it's produced a level of talent over the years, it's quite remarkable. So Susan is very much in the business of not just growing the talent here, but building the vision of Atlanta as a national stage with just a local address. She is the former head of the theatrical uh, group, uh, let's see, the TCG, the Theater Communica Theatrical Communications Group, and is someone who has given a real sense of meaning to a lot of new things that have been started in Atlanta. You may not know the color purple as a play started on this stage. The, the, uh, the Ghost Brothers of Darkland County, Bring It On the Musical, the 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, Sister Act as a Musical, all next door. And I am pleased to introduce the Artistic Director of the Alliance Theater, Susan Booth. So, yeah, you're, you're on right after the zombie. <laughs> so come talk, they said. Come talk about how to celebrate and elevate the cultural assets of the city as part of a larger conversation about how to attract and retain talent. This makes me happy. This makes me happy because I love a soapbox. But this makes me particularly happy because of the as part of a larger conversation part. Too often when we have these conversations about the health of our cities and the growth of our economies, we do this arm's length thing with the arts. Instead of talking about it as catalytic, causal, a factor in a larger equation, we talk about it as a stand-alone product. Worse, we talk about it as a precious stand-alone product an ornamental trophy for the haves, a condescending handout for the have-nots. How did this happen? Words are funny. Words are powerful. They're powerful independently, but really weird things happen when they come together in strange combinations. OK. Town and Country Magazine. Lifestyle publication teaches us all about living the beautiful life, whether we're in our ITP condo or in our mountainside cabin. Town and country, related but separate ideas. Garden and gun. <laughs> also, yeah, garden and gun enthusiasts, excellent. Watch your back. Garden and Gun, also lifestyle publication, something of a southern bent on this one. Again, related but separate ideas, not to be thought of concurrently unless you take your weeds out with more vengeance than the rest of us. <laughs> and then there's one more. Uh, there it is. Living and Arts. Also, lifestyle publication, also a pairing of related but separate ideas, living and arts. Not living for arts, not living is arts, living and arts. Okay, so the challenge here, celebrate, elevate, our cultural assets as part of a larger conversation. Okay, maybe we need to do a redefinition on arts. Maybe instead of thinking about it as an ornamental add-on to the elegant life, we could think about it differently. We could say that art is the capacity for wonder, it is the language of compassion, it is the expression of beauty. Maybe that's a little too ephemeral for the whole attracting, retaining talent thing. 
Maybe that's a little squishy to really be a civic priority when we have so many other things weighing on our time, our resources, our bandwidth. Okay, let's try again. Art is sweat. Art is muscle. Art is real and concrete. And once you surrender to it, it can take you to the mat and you'll never know what happened. Art is wonder. Art is compassion. And there is nothing ephemeral, ephemeral about beauty. Beauty launched a ship. It launched thousands of them, according to the ancient Greeks. And oh, those ancient Greeks. Whole lot of shaking going on, 6th century BC Athens. Same people, same place, same time, created democracy and theater. Huh. So Athenian democracy was a fantastic experiment in direct participatory theater, direct participatory democracy. These folks didn't elect a representative to go vote on legislation and bills. The Athenians showed up, a whole lot of them, without reference to economic class. And implicit in the model was the hearing of multiple truths, the airing of multiple truths, and then the voting on that which best aligned with your own values. So at the same time democracy evo is evolving, so too is theater. And you, lucky ducks, are about to get a two-minute lesson in the evolution of theater, more than you paid for. All right, here's how it starts. These are not-for-profit slides. <laughs> so theater begins with a single guy intoning his truth in front of a crowd, often for hours at a time. And the ancient Greeks not only stayed until the end, they paid for the privilege and thought of it as their civic duty. God, I love the ancient Greeks. <laughs> this, I think, explains why Greece endured and Romans flamed out, but that's a separate lecture. Okay, <laughs> next step in the evolution. Aeschylus comes along. He adds a second actor. Now, this does more than just double the cost of the production. This introduces the idea of protagonist and antagonist. This creates drama, and the audience is asked to align themselves between one of those multiple truths. Then you get Sophocles, then you get Euripides, then you get a third actor, another point of view, and you get this really cool thing, which is the chorus, which is essentially the audience's representatives up on stage asking the questions out loud that the audience is actually thinking in their head. Medea, what's up with that choice? <laughs> All right, congratulations, Dramatic History 101, you now know how it evolved. There have been, sure. We have subsequently added a few more actors, we have subsequently added a few more bells and whistles, but still implicit in the art form now is that basic notion we present multiple truths, and the audience is asked to lean in, to listen, and to align themselves. And that activity, that leaning in, that listening, that develops empathetic muscles just as surely as those sadistic exercises your personal trainer has you do for your biceps. And why does empathetic activity rank as a civic priority, why might it? Rocco Landisman, the former chair of the National Endowment of the Arts, used to like to say, art works. Art works for you. Art works on you. Participa participation in an empathetic event causes seismic psychic shift. Psychic shift that lasts. Oliver Wendell Holmes, kind of a smarty pants, had this to say. The mind, once expanded to the dimensions of larger ideas, never returns to its original size. Imagine a city informed by the twin tenets 
of emotional empathy and comfort with multiple truths. Imagine a town square where dialogue replaces rhetoric, where compassion displaces rush to judgment, where because we exercise the well-honed skill of holding multiple truths, we are able to sit with people whose voices, values, and lives are different than our own. We are able to lean in and listen and talk with the other, not just about the other. Okay, a little bit of skepticism. Maybe a little. No, I'm hearing it. It's okay. Going to plays makes for better people, makes for better cities. You know what? I want some data. So glad you asked. <laughs> the NEA recently published a study, Arts and Achievement in At-Risk Youth. This was a result of four longitudinal studies on children, teenagers, and young adults. This focused on the potential outcome of young people who had high versus low amounts of arts engagement. High arts engagement looks like this. It's coursework in visual art, music, theater, or dance. It's participation after school in lessons, or it's active membership and participation in arts organizations, drama club, band. Here's the big headline of what was found. Youth have better academic outcomes, higher career goals, and are more civically engaged when they have high arts engagement. Let me break that down a little bit more. Here's who was studied in these four longitudinal studies. Young people in the lowest quarter of social economic status. We're talking about the people without the safety net. Young people with high artistic input got better grades, had higher rates of college enrollment and attainment than their low arts engaged peers. 74% of eighth grade students with high arts engagement plan to go to college as opposed to 43% of their peers with low arts engagement. Well, how did that work out for them? 3% three times more likely to obtain their bachelor's degree. But you know what? There are other statistics that matter more for this audience at this time. Young adults who had had intensive arts experiences in high school were far more likely to exhibit civically minded behavior than their low arts peers. In other words, they vote, they volunteer, they are leaders in school and local politics. They show up. And they don't just show up, they do. Who wouldn't want this, right? Who wouldn't want young people who vote, who volunteer? Isn't this what we want the next generation of Atlantans to look like? Any city would. Every city does. But our city, if what I'm hearing from our mayor, from our civic and corporate leaders, if what I'm experiencing as an Atlanta is right, our city aspires to something more. We don't want to just be all that. We want to be the living embodiment of Dr. King's beloved community. That's our legacy, right? It's the legacy we all put our arms around. That's part of our DNA that gives us swagger. And isn't a city guided by those twin tenants, emotional empathy, the capacity to hold on to multiple truths, a city that in fact is constantly pursuing human and civil rights, isn't that a city that attracts and retains great talent? There is a man who sits on a bench behind the Art Center Marta Station. He is there late at night. I see him when I'm leaving the theater after productions. He's an older man, sits alone on the bench with his belongings. He sits in this kind of perfect halo of lamplight. 
and he is wearing a crown and a cape. And it's not a paper crown, it's solid. And that cape, I think once upon a time, was fur. And the man rocks, and he talks to himself. And he is there almost every night. This man has a life we see, a life that preceded us, preceded it, that we can only imagine. This man is layers of meaning and layers of metaphor. And as we walk by and we train by and we drive by, we wonder. We wonder how. We try to write a story why. And we try to imagine a better outcome. Why does that happen? How does that happen that we wonder, that we write, that we imagine, that we care? If you really want to live in a city with the capacity to wonder, with a heart that cares, with a willingness to hold multiple truths, and the willingness and ability to imagine a better outcome for the least of us, the best of us, and everything in between, then I'd argue you want to live in a city where art lives. You want to live in a city where art works, and you want to live in a city where art is always part of the larger conversation. Thank you very much.